Well, well, Xtool has done it. They've birthed another machine. Today we have the Xtool S1, a diode machine, supposed to be the middle ground between their D1 lineup and their P2 CO2 laser. How well does it fit? Is it the Goldilocks laser we've all been searching for? What's up guys, Sam here. Welcome back to Samcraft and welcome to a video showing off Xtool's brand new, newest machine. This is the Xtool S1 40 watt diode with riser base, honeycomb, air assist, and almost every bell and whistle they make. As we jump into this video, I want to let you know that I'm releasing and making this video before the machine has been offered to the public and before a lot of the information that you will already be able to disseminate has been made available at all. I got this machine just in a box in my workshop. There was a basic user's manual with it, but that was it. So my learning curve was a little bit steeper than what you guys will have, but I also may do things differently than the official recommended workflows or what you will learn through the wonderful land of having public knowledge that is the best way and best process to do things again just want to say that real quick as we jump into this video because i don't know i may do things differently because i didn't have anything else to go off of so what i have in my workshop is the x tool s1 i was sent the 40 watt diode machine with honeycomb bed air assist add-on and the riser base there are several different laser modules they are going to offer from 20 watt to 40 watt and I believe even a 1064 nanometer infrared module as well. Let's briefly talk about assembly of this guy. I'm gonna open the lid to kind of illustrate a little bit but you're also gonna see footage of the assembly process here. Basically, there's not much to assemble. You're going to take the laser module, attach it to the gantry that takes two machine screws, the power cable and your air assist hose. That's it. Other than that, there are a couple little blocks you need to take out on the right and left side. They are put there for shipping purposes. Make sure everything stays safe and sound, secure. You remove those and you're pretty much good to go. I also got the riser base with this machine and it is very substantial. It is not plastic like the body of the S1. This is a metal case or a metal base for this machine. The sides, the front and back are all metal. The inside is made of metal as well and overall it is extremely well built. Assembly for the riser base was very straightforward. You have four pieces to put together and then you remove the crumb tray from the S1 machine and place it into the riser base. The riser base has doors on the front and back that you push to open or let down and that gives you the option of pass through capability if you would like. And there's also a conveyor feeder, I believe, in the works or available now that you can add onto this machine to give power conveyance to your machine for extra long materials or projects. As we take a look inside the laser, let's see what we've got. Right up front, you have the laser module itself. You have a very nice cable management going on. You have true drag link chains, both on your X and Y axes. Everything in here is metal as far as machine movement and precision. Over to the right of the diode, you're going to see a little block with a needle. So what this is, is a touch probe that will lower down, touch the top of your material, and tell the machine exactly where that is for ultra precise engraving, cutting, and just getting you dialed in to the right setting every single time. As far as the gantry movement, you're going to see that it has some stainless steel roller wheels and the rods, very similar to what you see in the P2 and the D1 models. So this kind of X-Tools tried and true rail system of sorts. You're also going to see that the cabinet is lit up very well thanks to large LED lights on the front and back of the machine inside. There are also sensors below the lights which I believe are flame detect sensors and are a part of this machine's overall safety standard. This safety bar that Xtool has created has been lifted to a new standard with this machine. In addition to the flame detect sensors, there are other features of this machine which give it one of the best levels of safety that I have seen. You have a full enclosure, top, bottom, left, and right. This giant green lid is laser plastic or laser safety plastic to where they tell you you don't need to use laser goggles when the machine is running. 
It protects your eyes, which is great. There are also sensors built in when this machine is running. If your lid moves at all, like you're going to open it, it immediately shuts down the machine, which is awesome. And then of course, the fact that this is completely enclosed is a lung and breathing air quality safety feature that is wonderful. A lot of diode machines come with their enclosures and a lot of those enclosures fall short on what you really need. The X-Tool S1 is able to not only enclose all of the fumes, but with that powerful fan in the back pushing through the 3 inch exhaust, it does a wonderful job removing them out of your workshop. This is the point of the video where I practice what I always preach to my viewers. When you have a machine or you have new material, I always recommend running engraving or cutting tests to know exactly how your machine performs with that material itself. So with that being said, let me go ahead and run through my assortment of materials that I most commonly use. Things such as engraving aluminum, anodized aluminum, stainless steel, slate, wood, and also cutting through Baltic birch plywood and acrylic. Being a diode laser, you do have the option when engraving slate to get colorized results like I've shown in previous videos with other X-Tool machines or just diode machines in general. For my particular machine and the material, I was able to achieve a gold color slate engraving at 40 millimeters a second, 30% power, a tan color, 120 millimeters per second at 50% power, a gray color at 175 millimeters per second at 30% power, and a light gray at 400 millimeters per second at 20% power. When it came to cutting the Baltic birch plywood, I do two thicknesses. One is a three millimeter or eighth inch, and the other is a six millimeter or quarter inch thick true Baltic birch plywood. I do not use any kind of birch veneer plywood. This is true Baltic birch. Really strong stuff and notoriously difficult to cut through. However, with this 40 watt diode, I was able to get three millimeter Baltic birch to cut wonderfully at nine millimeters per second at 80% power, and then slice through the six millimeter Baltic birch at four millimeters per second at 80% power. Both of these were single pass cuts. I don't do multiple pass cuts in general because I rather get it through in one cut than multiples. When it came down to wood engraving, this is going to vary depending upon your wood species. With Baltic birch, I found good results at 300 millimeters per second and 80% power, and somewhat around the same ranges with bamboo. I don't normally use bamboo a lot with engraving because its variations and kind of wood construction gives you differing results when you engrave it. Some areas are super dark and look great. Other areas are very light and are hardly visible. And just that inconsistency and difficult with bamboo usually keeps me away from using it a lot in projects. As far as cutting acrylic, this is a diode machine, so you really need to stick to your dark, solid acrylics to get best results or to get any results. But I had wonderful results cutting my 3mm black acrylic as fast as 7mm per second and 80% power. However, I would usually try to dial that down a little bit on speed to make sure I have a safety margin. And I would probably run my acrylic somewhere around 6mm per second and 90% power for consistent results for cutting. For engraving the same black acrylic, I really get a lot of different colors and results from this. Anything from a white engraving to a silver to even what could be considered a dark gray or black. This is one of those interesting things when you get into engraving acrylics, especially the opaque ones, you can vary your speed and power to get different color results to really enhance your projects in the end. So if I was looking for as close to white or gray as possible, somewhere around the 50% power, 500 millimeters per second looks pretty good on my test. But again, I could go a lot faster with lower power to get darker gray or slower with higher power to get different texturized results. This no doubt is the benefit of running engraving and cutting tests. It gives you visual representations of the machine on that material to allow you to get creative and think just beyond one color or one finish style for your engraving and get some variations and interest to your projects. For the laserable leatherette, this is the uh, hat patches that you've seen in my other videos, the material that I engrave, cut out, and then use a heat press to apply. I got wonderful cutting results. I mean, as fast as 17 millimeters per second and as low of a power as 60%. I would probably run this one around 16 millimeters per second, 75% power. Again, just to ensure that I get cuts on the single pass, the first pass, don't have any kind of issues, and have projects kind of mess up as I run them. 
as far as engraving the laser bull leatherette, anything around the 500 millimeters per second, 50% speed did really well, but that does vary based upon the color or finish and the fact of if your material engraves to black, silver, gold, or something else. Again, that's one of the places where the engraving tests really shine and will teach you and help you see the benefits of different settings. Stepping over into the land of metals, I have black anodized aluminum, and the variation of speeds and powers give me everything from what you would consider to be a normal grayish light colored engraving over to something that gives a little bit of a blue tint, and then of course a dark gray engraving. Again, varying your speeding powers, you get different results. If I had to choose a sweet spot for this black anodized aluminum, I would say 60% power, 350 millimeters per second, but a lot of this is subjective to the person creating it, the lighting sources, and just what looks good to you personally. I ran two stainless steel engraving tests. The first one I did was my 175 millimeter to 400 millimeter speed test, and I got a little bit of colorization, which made me decide to run the slower test to see if I could get more colorization, which I didn't really get. Colorized stainless steel engravings is one of those things that is a little bit hit and miss with your machine and your material and is not something I generally do. I've actually not really ever done it other than just have it pop up in my engraving test for kicks and giggles. That being said, running at 400 millimeters per second, 100% power gives a nice dark engraving. And then going around your speeds and feeds, of course, you can change that engraving color from dark black or gray to something that kind of shines more silvery. And then even colors that kind of get into the brown or yellow spectrum as well. So one of the cool things about this machine is that it has an option where you can tell it where your engraving area is. In this example, I have a box here that I want to engrave the top of. And rather than try and mark the center, line it up with my framing, and hope that I get things right, there's a cool feature built within Xtool Creative Space that we're going to try out to allow me to tell the machine where my surface is, place my object there, and then engrave it. Over here on the computer, I drew a rectangle, and I'm gonna make this to be the dimensions of my box, 234 by 154. Now if I select everything, and I align them centered on each other, go ahead and make a group to lock them together. Now I can move this around, and this is my box lid. I have a rectangle for the box, and my design's right in the middle. Let me go ahead and make my red layer set to ignore. That way it doesn't output anything to the laser, but I can still use it to now pinpoint my marking area. Now I'm gonna go down here to the bottom three dots. I'm gonna click on the home button for XY and the home button for Z. You see the red crosshair is moving over. Now I'm going to choose this over here to the right. It says mark processing area, start marking. Click on that once. It tells me to move the laser module to make the light spot fall in the upper left vertex, press the button on the machine, then move it to the bottom right vertex and press the button on the machine. So let's do that next. All right, we're just gonna put our box in here. We, don't, we should not have to square it up at all. So let's go ahead and move the laser over. As much as I hate to grab it by hand, it's what we're supposed to do. I'm gonna put it right where the crosshair is right in this corner of the box. Looks good. Now I'm going to press the button on the machine once. I got a single beat. Over here it tells me it's logged. Now I'll move it to the next corner. Right there. Press the button. Now it's locked in here. Perfectly good. We go back to the computer. We can see that our XY coordinates are locked in. All right, once we click done on the framing procedure, we now have our image and a new green box is on our design now. What I'm going to do is line up my design with the green box. Get this thing as close as centered on this as possible. That looks good. Now I'm gonna click on framing. Press the framing button. Yeah. 
That looks perfect. Let's close it and let's run it. As far as noise level with the machine, right now it is running. The air assist is on, the fan is on, the duct fan, the machine, everything is going. And it's not that bad, especially when you compare it to the X-Tool P2 CO2 laser. That guy is loud. This one is much quieter. Not as quiet as the D1, but we're still talking about a different machine there. You don't have such a high-powered exhaust fan on the D1 with its enclosure as you do with the S1. And honestly, that's where most of the noise is coming from. The kind of high-pitched sound you hear, that's the fan running to exhaust all of the fumes and smoke out of the cabinet enclosure, which is exactly what you want. So this box turned out great. The biggest thing that I'm looking at is did it line up top and bottom centered? Looks really good to me. And is it centered left to right? Yes, it also looks centered left to right. So that feature that Xtool has built is very interesting. It is a little bit reminiscent to what I've seen with some CNC machines and other larger format lasers, you know, big cabinet grade lasers. So to see it in something that is a desktop machine is pretty cool. It is a feature that requires more back and forth between your computer and your machine. It would be great if there was a touchpad on this machine to be able to do all this at it. But hey, the fact that it's there on a machine with this price point and this kind of consumer level or target audience level is pretty cool. All right, let's talk about the things that I'm not crazy about with this machine. First and foremost, this green plastic you better watch it. It scratches easy. I was out here the other day watching this machine run. There was some dust on the top of the cover. So I went to wipe it off with my hand and it looked like it was smearing. So I kept wiping, looking. It was apparently getting scratched just from my hand. I didn't know I had such rough, rugged hands, but apparently I do. So my new machine now has scratches on the cover. Well, great. So beware, be warned, and be careful. You don't scratch your new cover if it really matters to you like it did to me. The other thing I don't like about this machine is that it doesn't have a camera. Now, if you've never used a camera with your laser, you may be thinking, yeah, whatever, Sam, big whoop. But having my X-Tool P2 with the camera and the alignment and positioning of it, coming back to this one with no camera, ah, I missed it. I really wished it had a camera. What that means is there is a lot of back and forth from the machine to the computer to make sure you get your design, your material or object lined up, frame it, move it, frame it, and move it over and over and over. It is something that if you've never had a different workflow, it's not going to bother you. But if you have, and you have to go back to doing this, you're really going to wish you had a camera, some software that handled it better, or better yet, I would love to see this, an actual control pad on the machine to allow me to move the laser head around, to home it, to lock in the start and end points for doing kind of markings for things such as this tee box that I engraved. All of that stuff, if they would have put it on the machine, would really seriously step it up to not the next level, but the level beyond that. So that would be awesome. The fact that the honeycomb bed floats around drives me insane. I don't like it. It also means that for me to create my jigs and fixtures to plop in, let's say, a big sheet of 20 business cards, 30 military dog tags, or anything else for batch engraving, I'm going to have to get very creative, which I am. I'm getting there, but it just means that I want to not be able to rely upon the honeycomb bed or the crumb tray, since I have the riser base, for any kind of jig or fixture alignment. I really wish the X-Tool made the honeycomb bed big enough to fill the entire machine. I know it would have been wasteful from a, well, it can't cut or engrave there, why do you want it there? But it would have been beneficial from a, it's locked in, it's a fixed point in your machine, now you can use the lip of your honeycomb bed as your alignment points for jigs. So, one of those things that I have in other machines, didn't have in this one, and again, once you have it, then don't have it, you realize how much you wish you had it. Fume extraction on this machine is good, although you will definitely want to have an inline duct filter to help supplement that and pull it out. As far as duct size, this is a 3 inch duct. I was hoping it would have been a 4 inch, but it's still a 3 inch. Seems like X-Tool is stuck on that 3 inch diameter, and that's what the P2 has. 
the S1 and D1 and all of that. So three inch it is. For me, I go to the hardware store and I get a HVAC rigid coupler or adapter. Goes from three inch to four inch. For this particular fan that I have hooked up on the wall, it's a four inch. But if I also plug this into my main fume extraction, I would then go from the four inch to six inch. I definitely like to run as large of ducting as possible to get all the fumes out as possible. The last thing I want to talk about is probably more of my personal workflow and just getting used to the machine than really something that should be a complaint, but it's in my head as an eh issue, so I'm going to put it on here anyway. I figure the more information I can give you, the more opinions I can give you, the better you'll be informed and be able to make decisions on your end. The whole process of probing the material to find out your height or focusing it is is okay but it's like an extra step i understand having the touch pro is awesome cool feature it definitely has great applications and i get that x tool wants to put it in there and have it but i feel like i'm kind of locked into using it or i need to figure out the mystery number that i can punch into x tool creative space to account for it what i mean by that is whenever i probe and measure a business card you know if the business card itself is a millimeter thick i can't punch in one millimeter the distance is 44.9 is what the probe sensed. So there's something going on there. Again, it's probably in the documentation that you will have with the machine that I didn't get. But it's just one of those things where it's like, ah, I always have to use the probe. Okay, it is cool, but it's an extra step over and over that I kind of wish just wasn't there so much. But that's me from a production standpoint, from an, a viewpoint of you have the machine or you're looking to get it to run a small business. It's one of those things that if you have to do it every time over and over and over, it's kind of going to get old. So we've reached the part of the video where if you are still here, you probably are wondering, Sam, should I get it? Do you think yes? Do you think no? I don't know. I don't know what kind of use case scenario you're going to have. I don't know what kind of budget you're working with, what your current goals are, your future goals, anticipated uses, and everything of the sort. What I do hope is that this video was helpful, informative, has given you a good look at the machine, along with a couple of other things such as the riser base, the honeycomb bed, the air assist, and helped you to make a more well-informed decision. Whether it be for or against this machine, hopefully I have helped you understand it more and have answered a lot of questions you have. If I've not, or if you have other questions in general, feel free to leave me a comment down below. Also check out links below to the machine from Xtool to my files if you have an Xtool machine running Xtool Creative Space or Lightburn. I sell both versions on my website and anything else educational or useful, I'll plop down there as well. Otherwise, appreciate you watching as always. Take care. I'll see you guys next time in the workshop.